another episode of Beyond the Stable. Today I have a really exciting guest who I think we're actually going to learn a lot from. It's Rich. <laughs> Rich, for anyone who doesn't know who you are, do you want to give a little bit of background on yourself? So I'm Richard Hayward. I am a dressage rider and coach um, and I freelance um, based in the Midlands. Um, and yeah, that's, Amazing. that's, sort of, <laughs> that's me. <laughs> I want to start off by taking it right back to the beginning and I okay. want you to tell me how you first got into horses. So, um, I'm originally a farmer's son, so okay. I'm, mum and dad were farmers, and I was told when I sort of wanted to get a horse that no, horses are this, that and everything else, and no, <laughs> I wasn't going to get a horse, and da, 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 and I, uh, my nan eventually, uh, for Christmas, bought me some riding lessons at the local, mm -hmm. local riding school. What age were you when you did I that? was probably sort of 14, 15, um, so started riding there. Um, I mean, I sat on ponies and things sort of when I was mm -hmm. young, but nothing seriously. Um, and then, um, yeah, I begged and kept begging for a horse, etc. And then for Christmas one year, my parents and my nan bought me and my sister a big, fat, hairy cob. <laughs> so I'd spent three years in a riding school. Yeah. Um, and we had him. <coughs> Did you um, know you were getting him no. or was it a total surprise? What was, was that like? He was a complete surprise. So... Um, some friends of ours um, had had horses and my sister had worked for them mm -hmm. and then I'd worked for them. Um, and between them all, they'd sort of planned all this and they'd found this cob, etc. And so the friends of mine um, had gone and picked him up, brought him yeah. to the yard. And I don't know how it came about, but for some reason we hadn't had a horse, but we got a saddle and a bridle and everything else. <laughs> very and random. So, yeah, very <laughs> random. And then um, randomly the, this friend rang up and said, oh, I've just bought a new horse and I wondered if your tack had fit. Mm. So I was like, okay. They were like, oh, bring your tack down and come and have a look. So we okay. took the tack down and put it on this cob. And, and I remember walking in thinking, because she was a show jumper, mm -hmm. I remember walking in thinking, this isn't like your usual type, but all right, yeah. fair enough. Um, anyway, put the tack on it. <coughs> she got on it and rode it around. So did I want to have a sit on? And my sister had a sit on and we rode it around. <coughs> and then we, they were like, my, my parents were like, oh, well, what do you think to him? I'm like, oh, he's lovely. No, no. And then we're like, oh, well, what do you, what would you say if we said he was yours? Oh, and of course, yeah, lovely. my sister then burst into tears. I was a bit like, oh my God. Did um, they do it on Christmas? Yeah. Well, well, it was sort of around Christmas. Around Christmas. Um, and you, then, yeah, and then they'd planned where we were going to keep it. God, that's the, every child's they, dream. Yeah, they <laughs> literally planned everything. So we hacked him back up to the yard we were going to keep out, which was just up the road. Um, and they'd bought some feed for it. They mm. liked the lot. It was all just set up, ready to go. Um, and, yeah, and then we, we had him for a long, long time. Um, and I did everything with him. Hunter trials, tried jumping it. He wasn't the most talented jumper. <laughs> I, I did showing with it. Um he went to the, like the coloured horse championships and mm -hmm. things um and then did dressage with him um i even took him to i did a work placement at ferdy Alberg's when i was at college i even took him there for a week um mm. and yeah i mean he got up to sort of medium level mm. um and he was great and then obviously my i moved away um with work and things like that and teaching and stuff and so um my sister then had him and she pushed around and then yeah i think he was put down sort of well when he was in his 20s or so how long did you have him for we had him when he was nine, I think he was. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we had him a fair old time. Yes. So you had him basically all the way through school type thing? Yes. Yeah. What was it like being a male who rides going to school and stuff? Did anyone say anything about it? Did they think it was cool? Um, not really, no. no. I sort of, I mean, of, I was the odd one out of school. Like Everybody yeah. was like into their sort of Playstations and things like that. Mm -hmm. I never had a Playstation, was never interested my time was sort of like get up sort the animals out and even before the horses obviously we had the farm yeah so it was always like the animals came first and then we get home be on the farm do mm -hmm. all that and, and so then did the horses before work after af before school after school um and yeah it sort of I didn't I wouldn't say I got bullied or teased or anything I, I knew I was the odd one out yeah um so yeah it was just sort of I went in did my did my thing at school and then came away again I was never really into school Mm. I mean, me and my sister are, are like chalk and cheese. Give my sister a load of numbers and languages and yeah. things, and she's there. Oh, give, wow. Yeah, I just stare <laughs> at it and think, what do I do with that? <laughs> Would you have any advice for a young boy at school who maybe is getting teased or something? How would you suggest like, power through that and keep um, going with your passion? Yes, yeah. 
basically, at the end of the day, your school years, yes, okay, they're important, mm-hmm. but that's not going to be the rest of your life. Yeah. It's like if you need to start sort of putting things in place. Because, I mean, I was a bit like, I wished actually I'd have focused a bit more at school mm. um, because then it would have made life easier straight after school. Yeah. Because, I mean, looking back, I would have probably, it would have been easier to have actually done well at school, got a proper job, earned proper money, and then been able to have the horses. Yeah. I mean, it is bloody hard work. mm mm-hmm not having money behind you and all of that to try and do it yeah what did you do straight after school so straight after school i then went to uh morton moral Mm -hmm. i went and did a two-year course there um so i did my first year and then what was the course uh national diploma in equine management so i did that and then in between the two years you had to go on a placement so i went on a placement to ferdy arlbergs which was great i mean i learned so much there it was hard work it was a real sort of eye opener into Mm -hmm. actually this is what i want to do so i went there and then when i left there i went back to college and to do my second year i met a lady called linda sands who she was amazing she was sort of the real kickstart to me being what I wanted to be mm-hmm. um, and she was very old school <clears throat> and she had um, she had a lovely horse called Charlie who was he she evented him um, and then she trained him on the flat and she would then give him lessons on him and I mean he could do all the tricks he could never do it well enough sort of compete at like, but he could do some yeah. passage and changes and pirouettes and things like that and he was a quirky thing he um, yeah I mean he I'll never forget I anyway she before I get to that she um she said to me, did I want to have some lessons on him? So I had some lessons. And then she said, look, I'll stop. The, if you want to take over the pain for him, I'll sort of stop the lessons and have him. So I had him as mine and rode him, competed him. And I thought I was amazing. I'd left birdies. I had come back. And then I'd got this horse that I could do all the tricks on. And yeah. she sort of, she helped me. But she left me alone for probably about a month. Mm-hmm. And I was like flying around doing some massage and chains and half pies and pirouettes. And I thought I was the dogs. And then she said, right, now we start work. And I was like, what do you mean? Yeah, I was like, well, I can do everything. She was like, no, now you learn to ride. I'm like, but I can ride. She was like, no, now you learn to properly ride. And then for the next month, two months after that, I was never allowed reins. I was never allowed stirrups. I lived on the lunge. That sounds like my living nightmare. (laughs) Yeah. She said, until you can learn, because, I mean, he, he was a bit of a nightmare in that he would like passage as a bit of an invasion and things like that she's mm. like until you can control him with your seat without your reins the stirrups everything else she said you're not riding and that was the best thing that could have ever happened to me um and so yeah so i had him and then i competed him a little bit and i'll never forget he was he was out and out her horse essentially and so we had my parents had this old trailer and linda wasn't around to take me to this show it was only down she lived like five minutes from the college the show was at the college so I got my parents to bring the trailer we put him in the trailer took him down to the college and it was an old rice trailer like rear load unload got down there all ready dropped the ramp couldn't get it off it would not come off the trailer and I tried and I tried and I tried everything I tried to ring her. She was doing a late night lectures, um, so couldn't get hold of her. Anyway, this went on for ages. Missed my test, couldn't do anything. I was like, I said to my dad, I was like, I don't know what to do. We can't get him out. Yeah. Anyway, so <coughs> we eventually, I was like, look, I missed the test. Let's take him back to the yard. Took him back to the yard. Dropped the ramp, still couldn't get it off. So anyway, eventually Linda finished lecture. She rang me. I said, she said, oh, how did it go? I said, I didn't do the test. Oh, what happened? I was like, I can't get him off the trailer. And she just <laughs> laughed down the phone. <coughs> she said, where are you? I said, we're at the yard. So she came back up. She said, um, and she was just laughing. I said, why are you laughing? I can't get him out. She said, because he's been trained never to step backwards out of the trailer. But... He's, he's always been in a trailer that is front on load. She said, he's never been allowed to come back out. I was like, right, well, this is a bit of a problem because this is a rear run load and we can't get him out. <laughs> she said, he'll, oh, he'll come out. Anyway, she, she literally went to the front of the trailer, had a mint in her hand. She told him to go back out. Straight out he came. <laughs> she was like, he knows never to come out. She said, I needed to send him to come out. And then after then, then he was great. He was, just, he was a quirky little thing. 
And I'll never forget that at her yard, so she had the arena and then there was a track at the side to the backfield where we used to go and canter mm-hmm. them. And she said to me the one day, oh, just go and give him a canter around the backfield. And I said, okay. She said, I'll stay in the yard. She normally came out as well. She said, I'll stay in the yard anyway. So I went out, took him up the track, went once around the field, and then he just literally stood bolt up right, spun around and came back down the track. <laughs> and, I, and I was like, I couldn't stop it. And I just yelled to her, then. Anyway, she came, turned round the corner and she just growled. Anyway, with that, he stood bolt upright again, turned back round and went back up the backfield. And was like, <laughs> he was so quirky. But he was the best thing ever. Um, and then I, when I left college, I brought him back with me um, and competed him. Um, and then, yeah, and then he sort of retired with my sister and she potted him around a bit. And then, yeah, we had to put him down when he was sort of 25, 26, something mm. like that. And was it always dressage? No, I started off, my dream was to be a show jumper. Right. All I wanted to do was show jump. Um, and, I mean, in the early days, like before I went to, before going to college, and that, I just wanted to jump. And then mm. I sort of rode horses and the cob didn't really jump and I had various horses that I wanted to jump and things and they just didn't, they just weren't very good. But all of my horses sort of went well on the flat. Yeah. So it was just sort of a natural progression that, Actually, maybe that's my calling in life and not trying to wang them over fences <laughs> <laughs> uncontrollably. Um, and yeah, and I was always, I was terrible at seeing a stride. Mm. I mean, I could find a stride, but only because I would be like, whoa, 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 and end up doing a, like, a pirouette country in front of the fence and be like, now jump from there. And so, <laughs> so yeah, mine would always go on a short one. They'd never go on a long one. <laughs> yeah, I was far too controlled. So yeah, it was, like I said, it was a natural progression to sort of just, then just be on the flat and... And do that. And to be fair, I can't even remember the last time I left the floor. Mm. And then you've worked your way all the way up in BD. Yes, yeah. It's been a hard slog and, and everything else. Do you want um, me to speak me through a bit what happened after that horse? So after him, I was then like, well, I'm going to be freelance, buy celibate, etc. Um, and it just didn't work out through various things. Mm-hmm horses that didn't work out I remember I bought a really nice young horse but ended up losing a load of money on that and then um and then yeah I've worked on various yards um working for them um I worked for a lady um not far from where I grew up she had a riding school um and I worked on that for her for about five years and we bought and sold a bit um and then yeah and then I've had various horses for owners which I've ridden and competed and things um and sort of yeah i moved to essex um and worked for a vet and a physio um and they took on a stallion which was it came from france it was trained to sort of pre st george badly but it was trained to pre st george and we managed to sort that out. i mean they only paid a pound for him because he was sort of ready to be written Mm -hmm. off um and between them they both got him right and i competed him sort of pre st george into one um and he was a lovely horse Pernambuco he was called um and then I rode various horses for them and then and various horses in Essex and then it wasn't until I moved to Surrey that I was on a yard and um I didn't have a horse at that point and there was a lady who owned a big horse on the yard which was literally across the lane and she brought him over to have a lesson and a massive horse 18 one and he was great and the trainer that I was training with at the time um who gave the lesson he said that could be a grand prix horse yeah was like, oh, really could it and then anyway and so he suggested to her that i sit on him a bit um because he she was a little bit frightened of him um because mm-hmm. i mean he was massive so anyway i started riding him for a bit and i rode him for about six months and he sort of went he did novice qualified for everything then elementary qualified for everything with that and i always thought he was a nice horse yeah. But never sort of anything, wow. Mm-hmm. He moved nicely and he, he, was, he was a nice horse. Um, and then I was trotting around one day and I just picked a stick up. And as I was trotting, I just touched him with the stick and it literally just bounced. And I was like, oh my God, th- this could be something proper. So anyway, I rode, rode him for a bit. And then in that time, um, I lost my father and had some inheritance from him. And... I was like, and and I, I we didn't, I didn't get a lot of inheritance, and I did my HGV and bought a car and all of that sort of thing. And then I was like, I want to buy the horse. <clears throat> I was like, this is a proper one. And so I went to the lady. I said, Oh, I, I want to buy him. And it went backwards and forwards. Well, I could get this amount and da 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 da. 
And I was like, well, I want to give you X. And, and so I went back and forth like this. Anyway, we agreed on a price. <clears throat> and I remember it to, to this day. I walked back into the yard and um, a friend of mine in the yard was there. And we were like, well, how did it go? I said, oh, well, I've agreed to buy it for X price. And I remember she looked at me and she went, um, well, you don't have that left. I said, I oh, know I don't. She was like, well, what are you going to do? I said, I don't know. And I, <laughs> and I just sort of jokingly said, oh, I don't suppose you want to be an owner, do you? And she just went, yeah, I'll give you half the money. So okay. we bought in between us, um, Lucy. And, um, and yeah, and then it's sort of gone on from there. And he's moved around with me everywhere. Um, and, yeah, he's just, I, I mean, I didn't have him till he was nine. Mm-hmm. And he just potted around a couple of prelims and novices. Um, and he went very quick. And he, he's a lovely horse. He's got a lovely temperament. <clears throat> and he's one of those, you ask him a question and he gives you some sort of an answer. Yeah. He was like, it took him probably a couple of months to learn a change. <clears throat> and then within a couple of weeks, he could do his fours, threes and twos. That's amazing. It, yeah, it was like, he, but he's that sort. He, he, I say he's a bit thick and how he remembers everything, I don't know. <clears throat> but he was like, if I asked it to change, he was like, I do a change now. Yeah. So as long as I could ask him quick enough, he would do a change. Um, and then, yeah, and he went very quickly. And then he's done a couple of years Grand Prix. Um, and I mean, uh, you hear everybody saying that, like, oh, I wished I knew back then what I know now and everything, yeah. which, which is very true. I would have done a lot better job with the horses before if I knew then what I know now. But actually, if I hadn't had them, I wouldn't have then done as good a job with this one yeah. to get him as quickly to where he is. <clears throat> so, I mean, it's all relative. Um, and so, yeah, that's sort of. And then I've got a chestnut horse at the moment that is owned by a lady called Georgina. He evented to advanced um, and. He, he's a funny little character that he's he can do everything for the Grand Prix as long as you convince his head he can do it. Okay. If he if you're even if you're in a session, you can get on him for a session and start doing things and he's just not there mentally and you just put him away. Yeah. Because it's his head that stops him. But I mean he competes into one, he's about to go and do an into two soon. Um and like I said he can do everything for the Grand Prix except the ones. He struggles with the one time changes. Um but yeah, I mean, he he's Irish bred through and through. Nothing amazing. Mm-hmm. Um, I knew him when he was eventing, and he always moved very nicely. And I, um, the one day um, with the person that was riding him, I was helping them, and I said, "Oh, does it Piaf?" And they were they were eventers, and they were like, oh, I don't know what's that. I was like, "Well, just walk him down the long side," and I just walked next to him with a stick, and I just tapped him a little with a stick, and he literally just sat and Piaf. I was amazing. like, "Can you train that to Grand Prix?" And I'm like, "Oh." And then, yeah, so I ended up sort of inheriting him, sort of, um, <clears throat> through the situation at the time. Um, and, yeah, so he's been with me. I mean, he's 17 now. Um, he went and did an into one the other day, um, and he won that with nearly 66%. So, I mean, if something Irish bred that's evented out and out. Yeah. I mean, you, you as long as you they've got a good temperament, you can train them. Yeah. And it's all about sort of training reactions with them. I've always said it. If I pick... If I had something in hand and was thinking about Piaf with it and I had it in hand and I touched it with a stick and it literally reared up and bolted with me and dragged me down the arena, I'd give it a pat and go, yeah, great. Because you can do something with a reaction. Yeah. If I touched it and nothing happened, I'd think, oh, because then you've got to make a reaction first. Then you can start training it. It's just like, as long as you get a reaction, even if it's the wrong one, you can do something with it. So, have you got the two horses at the minute? Have you got yeah, just got the two horses. Um, I ride a young horse for the people that own the yard where I'm at. Um, he's having a bit of time out at the moment. He, he's lovely. He's got a bit of a funny temperament. Um, but he's very talented. Very mm-hmm. talented. And, I mean, he's show jumping bread. He's, he's got show jumping blood in him. Um, and he's very nice. I mean, I am quite excited with him. Um, but, yeah, he's having a bit of time out to sort of grow. And he, he's a big horse, so he's just going to take a bit of time to mature. But I'm, I'm never in a rush with the big horses. Yeah. As long as they sort of, you put things in. And it's having ridden at Grand Prix now and everything, you realise that actually you start putting things in very early on. You mm-hmm. don't produce them and ride them like at novice level because they're a novice. And then at elementary, because you start putting things in for Grand Prix when, yeah. they're, when they're babies. Um, and so, yeah, he, he's got bits in there already. Um, he's sort of played with a change each way. Nothing amazing. He's got from one leg to the other. Mm-hmm. So it's in there. Um and yeah, he's he's quite exciting, but yeah, he's having a bit of time out to mature and, and grow. Um, and then yeah, then I've just got the chestnut horse and then the big horse. Obviously, a very talented rider. Have you got any tips for anyone who's trying to get into BD, 
that kind of you learnt over the years? Um, not really. I mean, it's just, <laughs> just just sort of. What are, what is one of those things that you would tell your younger self now looking back? Um, it's, it's going. To, well, how do I put it? Don't always trust everybody. Yeah. I mean, over the years, I have been promised this, that, and everything else from people. And you think, yeah, amazing. So mm -hmm. you sort of go about changing your whole life, and nothing ever really comes from it. Yeah. So now I'm a little bit more like, well, yeah, that would be lovely, but I'll wait to see, see if, if it happens. If it actually happens. Um, but, I mean, it's basically just sticking with it. Give you, have a plan. Have a goal. It, yes, there's going to be bumps in the road and everything else on the way up there, but if you stick to where you want to go, you will eventually find a way there, and you may have to go around the houses to get there, mm -hmm. but something always happens. And, and I mean, in the in the tough times, it's like nothing ever stays tough forever. Yeah. I mean, it, it's with various things in my personal life, losing my mum, losing my dad and everything like that. It's a bit like life goes on. Mm -hmm. Yes, like with that, I could have just sat there and gone, oh, woe is me, and aren't I hard done by and everything. But you just have to carry on and keep going. And it's like horses don't know that bad things have happened and things. So it's just keeping going and just work through it. Yeah. So you go out and you do all these amazing big competitions. Uh -huh. Do you ever get nervous? Um, no. Not at all? I used to, years ago, years and years ago. The most nervous I've ever been, I, I, I remember a time I took... Um, I took like three or four horses, three horses to a show uh, with my dad and they were doing two tests each and I remember trotting round on, and they were all owned horses, and I remember trotting around the edge of the arena on this one horse that was the nicest one of the lot and I was just like, I don't know where I'm going. <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, and I literally crapped my pants. <laughs> and I was going around the edge and I was like, what do I do, what do I do, what do I do? Um, and then... I was like, no, just for, just go through the motions. And I, I didn't forget it. I just rode it without even thinking about it. Mm -hmm. and, and it happened. But no, I, I, don't, I don't really get nervous. I, I used to. I mean, I, obviously I did when, like, the big horse went, like, did his first Prix St. George and when I went and did my first mm -hmm. Grand Prix. How do you get through those nerves? Um, it's just trusting in what you know. Mm -hmm. Just do what you always do. And... Um, it's like people, uh, it was, it's been quite interesting actually at the area festivals just gone because I've been and helped a couple of clients sort of like warming up at those. And it's been very interesting seeing how much people are completely different. So like the, the, uh, there's one lady that I teach, um, I, I taught her at home quite a bit, etc. And then she got to the show and she just didn't ride. Yeah. And when she did ride, she rode it like she was in the test in the warm up. I'm like... No, do do what you always do at home. Stretch mm -hmm. it, make it loose, then pick it up, etc. Um, and yeah, it's just having confidence in in what you do. Just do your own thing. And and I mean, I've I've done it myself. You go around the warm up and you see beautiful horses yeah. going round, and you're like, oh my god. And then you try and get something that you've never got ever. And it's like, well, what's what's the point in that? It's just just you and your horse do your own thing. And as long as you come out, and even if it's a rubbish score, as long as you come out and you're happy with your performance mm -hmm. then go through it evaluate it and then sort of work on on bits you need to work on yeah during um your whole journey have you ever had a fall that sticks out yeah yes yeah i Do you have a story about that well i i worked for a lady it was it was after i came back from college um i was working for her and she she had some quirky horses and she said, oh, would you get on this one? I said, okay. So she, but I mean, it was so quirky. Like she had to hold it. You had to lie over it first right. and everything else. You had to treat it like a break at every time. So anyway, I was sort of lying over it and it decided it was going to have one of these moments. But the, she was standing the one side, the opposite side of the way where I was lying over it. Anyway, it decided that it was going to do one. Mm -hmm. And, but she, I mean, she kept hold of it. But in keeping hold of it, it sort of ran faster than the speed of light around her. And, of course, the sort of G-force, or whatever you call it, sort of then threw me to the outside yeah. as I was lying over it. And I remember landing with, on the, around the edge was just railway sleepers. Landing with the railway sleeper, like, straight in the middle of my back, like, backwards over it like that. Um, and I just sort of lay there for a moment. I was like, well, I'm not dead. That's fine. Mm. 
And then I was like, I'm fine, I'm fine. Stood up and literally everything just went black. God. And then I just literally like dropped to the floor. I was like, I just need to stay here a moment. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, that was probably the... Oh no, and then I, when I worked for the lady with the riding school and things that we did sellers, um, we bought a horse between us that was lovely. Really nice mare, but it was wild. Mm-hmm. Um, anyway, got it going. It was great. Anyway, we took it cross-country schooling. And I'm not a cross-country rider by <laughs> any means. So I popped some things. <clears throat> that was great. And then there, at Summerford, they had, I don't know if they still got it, they had like a rail and then brought one stride to then a little step off. Mm-hmm. And me being me, in my head at that point, why I thought, I don't know, I thought, well, I won't put it together first. I'll nip inside there and just drop off the step. Right. So I came round inside the jump, got to the step. She went, oh, no, I don't know. And I went, no, go. And she was very genuine, so she did. Mm-hmm. But she leapt off this step, landed, and yeah, as I say, I'm not a cross-country rider. So we landed, and then she sort of cantered away, and I was sort of half off, half on, half, on, half off. And I rem- can remember thinking, I'm not getting back from this. So I thought, oh, it's fine, I'll just drop off, that'll be fine. Yeah. So as I dropped off, my foot got stuck. And I can remember the mare cantering across this field and all and looking across and just seeing its hind legs by my head. I was like, this is it. I'm dead. Absolutely dead. And that, it seemed like forever, but it was only a split second anyway. She sort of cantered. I remember bouncing a little bit by her back legs. Um, and then my foot came out and I remember mm-hmm. rolling a bit. Um, luckily, it did come out because then she carried on cantering straight, jumping fences. Um, and then, yeah, and literally, I was very lucky. All I did was graze my arm. I was, that is so I, lucky. I was stiff for days. But, yeah, when I saw its hooves by my head, I was like, I am dead. Yeah. Um, and, I mean, to be fair, she turned out to be the lady's best. She bought me out of her, one of her best horses, and it did everything, eventing with her and things. Mm-hmm. Um, Buffy, she was called. Um, but, yeah, that was probably the scariest moment. Have you ever had broken bones or anything like that? Touch, Touch wood, wood, no. <laughs> Find some wood. Touch wood, no. I've never broken anything. <laughs> That, um, that fall, did that knock your confidence at all? Yeah, I've never been cross-country again. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, you don't need, encounter very many sort of natural obstacles in the arena. So, yeah. yeah, no, I've never been cross-country again. Have you ever had a confidence knock on your flat work? I, I've had confidence knocks. Um, may, <laughs> so when I moved to Essex, I moved to Essex to be with a partner. Um, and... I'll be honest with you, I am terrible. Like if I'm in if I have a partner that rides or something, or I'm in a situation where there is somebody that is braver than me, mm-hmm. I'm a nightmare. <laughs> what be- do you mean? What do you do? Because I know if I like if I like say this young horse that I ride, he can yeah. be a bit quirky. If I know there is someone braver and if I kick up enough fuss, mm-hmm. that they will get on it. Right. And then and I don't realise I do it. I subconsciously then use that as bit of as a bit of a sort of safety blanket yeah way out um and and i was a nightmare the partner i was with over in essex um he 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 was very brave and always came across very brave and everything and i i very nearly gave up in essex because Mm -hmm. i was a bit like i can't ride these horses i can't ride the horses i need to be riding to get anywhere so what's the point i would always get him to get on them and all of that yeah um and then, yeah, I, over the years, I mean, you learn a lot about yourself, both in horses and, and personal life, over the older you get. And I, I've realised now that actually, if I'm with someone in that situation, it, it doesn't work for me. Because I all, like I said, if I know if I kick up enough fuss that someone else will get on it. Um, so now, yeah, and uh, but I know like now, being on my own, doing the horses on my own and things, that the horses that I've got, that there is no one else to get on them. Yeah. It's like even with this young horse, there's, there's no one else to get on him when he's being an idiot and so it's like well, I've just got to do it so then I don't even think about it I and don't that's even... just the mindset yeah. just get on with I it I don't even think about being nervous mm-hmm. um, and it, it's uh, something an, an, an ex-partner has stuck with me that he said he was like well, what do you think when something's being naughty what what goes through your mind I said like, I just want to get off it Yeah. I'm like no just get me off I said well what happened what do you do he said, well, when something's naughty with me, he said, my first thought is, how dare you? Oh, God, I'd love that mindset. How, yeah, how dare you do that? I didn't ask you to do that, so how dare you do that? Yeah. I was like, actually, 
that's and I mean it's taken a lot and I do think a little bit like that now I mean when something really lets rip then I do still want to get off it um <laughs> but but I um now I do think a little bit like that when something's starting to be a bit like I'm a bit like no put it to work a little bit and mm -hmm. like how dare you if you've got sort of infused amount like, to think about being an idiot then you can put that into being constructive about it yeah We've spoken about a lot of negatives, falling off and stuff <laughs> yeah. like that. Let's have a positive. What is your favourite achievement or favourite memory to do with horses? Um, I mean, there's been quite a few. I mean, the first sort of real thing for me was, in the early days, was I was second at the... They used to run a talent spotting thing, the BD did, um, and that was great. Um, so we used to... I took the old chestnut horse that I had... Um, and you used to take your horse, you used to ride through a test, you used to have a mm -hmm. training session, and then the second day, the top however many, then used to, it was either swap, in later years, they you swapped horses, but where when I did it, they, um, like Talon, brought a load of horses right. down, and you, you had to literally get on them blind, ride them, assess them, etc. And that was great. I mean, I was second with that. That was great. Um, and then things like doing my first Grand Prix. It was something I'd always wanted to do. Never thought I'd get there. Mm -hmm. Trotting down the centre line and getting to the end of your first Grand Prix, no matter how bad it is, is a real sort of, yes, like, we made it. Yeah. Um, then you realise, actually, that nothing's where you want it for the Grand Prix and mm -hmm. it's hard work and it is a lot. It doesn't matter how often you hear, like, Carl Hester and people like that saying, yeah. like, oh, it's a long way round a Grand Prix and... Uh, it is a bloody long way around the <laughs> Grand Prix and there is no let up. There is no having a break or anything like that. You are on it all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I mean, go to the, I always love going to the big shows, like the Premier Leagues and things. They're mm -hmm. just great. And the atmosphere is just, it, it is what you make it. Yeah. Um, it's like I, I work for pe with people and, and grooms and that, that that they've got and it's a bit like, you have to make it fun, like going to the big shows. If you don't make it, it fun and enjoyable, then it, it, like I said, it, it is what you make it. Then mm -hmm. it just becomes a chore. It's like going to the shows. It's great going to the big shows, whether you're riding or just being there helping people and yeah. things. See, seeing people you know that you don't see from one show to the next, but then just having a laugh about it. And, yeah, it, it's great. I love going to the big shows. Um, and, yeah, I can't think of any other big achievements. What just... level does your sister ride to? Oh... Um, well, I mean, she, she's got two children now, so she's just sort of a happy, happy hacker plodder around when she can. Um, I mean, she did, I think she rode some elementary and maybe a medium. Yeah. Um, what was her reaction when you first went Grand Prix? Not a lot, really. Not a lot, I do <laughs> care, whatever. <laughs> yeah, she, to be fair, I am a nightmare. I'm the worst brother ever because I don't keep in touch enough. Um, and it's always a bit like, oh, I'm busy and da da da. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, she's just, she just wants me sorted in life because I'm always a bit like, oh, this has come up, I'm going there and, and oh, I'm moving there. And she's like, where are you living now? <laughs> yeah, no, I am the worst brother ever. Um, to be fair, dad was the, the main, and mum as well, but dad was real like, but my dad was very farmer. Right. As in like, he never showed emotion, never nothing. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until that he passed away and sorting things out. Um that we found an envelope and he'd kept every sort of magazine article he'd oh, cut out, amazing. newspaper article, anything to do with me and mm. doing something good, he'd kept. And I've still got the envelope with it all in there. Oh, that's now. lovely. Yeah. It, it, well, it was quite emotional when I found that. Was a yeah. Bit like, oh. yeah. So, yeah. Okay, let's speak a bit about the teaching. How did you get into the teaching? So, um, I ended up working at this the riding school for five years. Um, I went there from being freelance and I only started teaching there because the, the friend of mine that owned it, she said to me, she said, I've got a pony right. that nobody can stay on. <laughs> she was like, would you come and sit on it? I was like, yes, all right. If I have to. Yeah. So anyway, I got there. She said, all the arenas are full. We're going to have to go in the paddock. I said, okay. I said, let me lunge it first. So I popped it on the lunge, walk, trot, canter each way, sweet as anything. I was like, this is a doddle. <laughs> she said, just watch it. I said, right. So anyway, I took it into the corner of the paddock where she was sort of standing, on clipped the lead, uh, lunge line, put my foot in the stirrup. My backside hadn't even touched the saddle and I was flat on my back. Oh, God. I was like, Jesus, like, this is what it does. And I was like, right. I was like, right, hold on to it. I'm getting on it. 
she held on to it put my foot in bang straight on the floor <laughs> I was like right I said really hold on to it now. I said I'm getting on this mm. I did manage to get my leg over it and my bum in the saddle before and I did land on my feet this time but yeah she was like leave it I'm not even bothering yeah. with it so anyway so then she said would I go and do some teaching so I went and did some freelance teaching in the riding school for and then ended up taking a full time job and did deliveries buying and selling and teaching there what level were you teaching there was it kids or yeah mixture? all sorts yeah rising trot all sorts um and i have to say that there's there was that really sort of opened my eyes to things even back then that like teaching teaching people rising trot mm-hmm. you get told well you just go up and down well no you don't there, there was I, there was somebody i was teaching and i can remember now that i was, and they just couldn't get it and it made me sort of stop and think well what do i do yeah and i don't just stand up sit down um and so yeah that sort of got me into the teaching and then i went to essex and and i always just wanted to ride and and do and i taught a little bit on the side for some extra cash um and then it wasn't until sort of moving back here that i sort of was like people like oh would you come and give me a lesson would you come and Mm -hmm. and and it's just sort of built up from there um and, and i love it and I, I really love teaching sort of like when you get a client with, with a horse and that, that it's not straightforward. Yeah. <clears throat> when I love having to think outside the box, um, thinking about sort of trying to think about what's going on like in front of you, having to think of, well, what will help it? What exercise could I do to mm-hmm. help the rider get that, to help the horse get this and, and everything else? And when you see things changing, it, it's... It's great. It's a great feeling. I get as much buzz from the teaching, sort of helping people, that I do riding myself. Yeah. It, it's great fun. I love it. And you've started teaching influencers and stuff now yeah. on vlogs and oh, YouTube. Oh, I know. <laughs> How do you find that? Well, it's just, it's just sort of evolved. Because I, I, I remember um, when Meg messaged me, because I had no idea who she was. Mm-hmm. She just messaged me, um, can I have a lesson? How yeah. did she find you? Don't know. Don't know. You've never asked. No, never asked. <laughs> she just. What did she message you on that Instagram? Something like that. Mm. One of the one of the socials, and so yeah. So she said, "Would you come and give me a lesson?" I said, "Yeah." So I just rocked up, gave her a lesson, and I can remember it as she was walking around. I said, "Also, oh, what do you do for a living?" Mm-hmm. She went, "Oh well, I'm an influencer." I said, "Oh well, what do you do for a living?" <laughs> she went, yeah, what? <laughs> that is that's my job. I was like, "Well, that's not a proper job, is it?" <laughs> and um, I said, "Surely you can't earn a living from that." Anyway, she she told me. I said, "Oh." So what? You don't do anything. You just film yourself film. in general life and put it on <laughs> and people pay you for that crap. And she's like, <laughs> pretty much, yeah. I was like, oh. Anyway, I still didn't. I didn't go away and Google her or anything like yeah. that. I just was like, oh, well, it's just some kid, isn't it? Just <laughs> Eventually she'll realise she needs to get a proper job. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, and then she did, we did a couple of videos and then I can't remember what, what was first. the first one I can't remember I think it might have been the vlogmas one with the big horse yeah and she said would you do vlogmas I was like what the hell is <laughs> vlogmas she went oh well it's a series of videos I do at Christmas da, 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 da. And I was like oh whatever she went this year the theme I'm doing is riding professional horses she mm-hmm. went could I come and do use you as the dress size one I said yeah of course you can so anyway so then before that, I did sort of go on and find out who she is, and he's had all these followers, and I thought, oh, I need to make a bit of an effort here. So um, I was um, working for Sue Carson at the time, mm-hmm. and she, I told her about it. She said, oh, I'll use one of the saddles if you want. He hadn't had it on before. And so I that morning, I clipped him. I stuck the saddle on it. I rode him myself in it, and he was fine. He was a bit fresh, but he was fine. I thought, oh, it'll be all right. So anyway, so then she came and I'd warned her how big he was. Mm-hmm. And she walked in, she was like, Jesus, he's massive. Is this your 18 hand one? Yeah. And I was like, yeah, no, you'll be fine, you'll be fine. <laughs> and and when I when I first had him, I knew he could bronk a little bit. Mm-hmm. So anyway, we, we did the video and stuck that on. Um, and he was a nightmare. Trotting was fine. Cadre- and in fairness to her, he's only ever had one person off in his life. Yeah. That I know of. Um, and it was a friend of mine. And she was a livery on the yard with me and I was clipping the chestnut horse and I clipped the black horse. I said, look, I haven't got time to ride it. I'm taking him to a show tomorrow. Would you just get on a walk, trot, canter him round? Yeah. Oh, can I, can I? Yeah, crack on. So I left her in the school, was clipping and I could see the arena and I saw her walking around. I said, well, have you cantered him? She went, oh no, he's, he's trot massive, da, da, da. 
I said, his canter's lovely. I said, just pop him into canter. And, and he's quite goey in that you don't really have to touch him with your leg. So she popped him into canter and off he went. And he cantered around and around and around in circles and all that. And I said, right, just go across the arena, half hole, ask him to canter the other way, and he'll do a change and canter the other way. So she came across the diagonal. She did exactly what I told her. She went half hole. She flung her leg back and put her leg on to do a change. Well, it felt her leg, and obviously her legs are a lot shorter than mine, so he got touched in a place he'd never been touched before, and literally <laughs> he just went and bronk, bronk, bang, and fired a head first into the floor. And they sort of stood there shocked as if they like, why are you on the floor? Yeah. <laughs> and she was like, oh my God, I was like, it's fine, get on him. Threw her back on him, and then she kind of ran, didn't change, and he was fine. And that was a little bit the problem. A, he was in a saddle he hadn't really, wasn't really used to mm-hmm. with Meg. I had clipped him. And, again, her legs are a lot shorter. So trotting was fine and then cantering. And then, to be fair to him, he did take the piss a little bit out of her. <laughs> that after a couple of times of her getting in the canter and him going, I'm going to bronk, mm-hmm. and Meg sort of went, oh, what's it doing? He was then like, oh, I've got this one. Yeah. Um, so he did have to get told a bit, and then he was all right. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, so that was the real first one, I think, that went on. And that went, and then it just went mental. I was getting like my like I I know when Meg has put something on because my phone is like ting 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 ting. Yeah. I was like, what has she done now? Um, and then yeah, then it just went mad, and I, I was reading through the comments and things. It is I I do have to chuckle at the comments. It was like the so the one that I went on of her me teaching her on her new one, mm-hmm. and me calling it it. It does make me <laughs> chuckle. It's like I teach so many horses. Yeah. I don't remember their names. Um, so now I sort of make a point of being like, oh, no, sorry, Wilma and all that. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so no, and then it just went mental. And then I I, I had messages about going teaching to people. Yeah. And, and I'm like, really? But, I mean, it's quite nice. It's like, like from me growing up training and things like that, I've trained with a lot of people Mm -hmm. over the years. And you take a bit from each one and some works for you, some doesn't work for you. And so I sort of have found what works for me um, through training and things. And it's quite nice going off teaching people and that, that actually what works for me actually works for quite a lot of other people. Yeah. Um, And it's very simple. There's nothing complicated about it. Um, Mm -hmm. But yeah, no, that I like teach him again, then like uh, other influencers have, have come along and I'm like, really? Hang how on. do you find being in front of the camera? Because you've done really well today. Off camera, we were speaking about how it's not really Yeah, it's thing. not for me. Like, get me going and I'm away with yeah, it. Yeah, you've done so Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> but the initial sort of thought of it, like driving here, I was just like, this is my yeah. worst nightmare. I couldn't think of anything worse. Yeah. Um, But yeah, no, it's like, like especially like teaching the people, like, I I get people like, oh, do you mind if I video this to put mm-hmm. it on the show? And so I'm like, no, not at all. Because yeah. I just ignore it. Mm-hmm. It's like, I am here teaching you. And if you want to film that, that's great. Okay. If you don't, then again, that, that's fine. It's like, but if you want to film it, like, like makes you just, and like Pete, Pete films it, and we have a laugh about it now and yeah. everything. But now it's just like, I just go into teaching mode. And if someone's yeah. videoing it, great. If they're not, then it doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. And you're actually going to be at our demo evening in yes. June. It's June the yeah. 22nd, guys. It's not been released yet. It probably will have been by the time this goes out. But I'm super excited to have you featuring. It's going to be, it's going to be amazing. You'll be regretting it. <laughs> How Have you done demos and stuff in the past? Yes, yeah. I've done very How fun. do you think it's going to be doing the demo in June? Are we excited for it? What are our thoughts yeah, on Yeah, I it? have to say, I love doing extra demos. And again, I will be absolutely crapping my pants beforehand. <laughs> but as soon as I get in there, I just get going with it. Yeah. Um, yeah, I've done various demos. Um, I've done sort of taken horses to doing hand demos mm-hmm. on, on demos with people. I've ridden on demos. I've done all sorts of demos. Yeah. And I absolutely love it. I, I get a real buzz from doing it. If I don't get nervous before that, then there's something really wrong. <laughs> um, but like I said, again, it's like once I get in there and get going, mm-hmm. then I'm away with it. And it just sort of flows and everything else. Yeah. I never go in with a plan. It's just go and do what we do have you done a demo since you've started your socials no no so i no. think it'll be interesting yeah, i think yeah. it'll be a bit different yeah because people know you now well this is the but... thing because um we went to the national equine show yes and that was the weirdest day i have ever had in my <laughs> life 
I what, am, people coming up to you I and getting never photos walked, and stuff? The weirdest thing was walking around, noticing people notice you. Yes. I was just like, initially I was like, why are they staring at me? Is there like something yeah. on me or something? And then um, we were getting a coffee when we got there and some lady came and touched my arm. She was like, hi, sorry to interrupt. Um, my daughter recognised you for, from the YouTube video. Would you mind having a picture? I'm yeah. like, uh, yeah, all right. <laughs> yeah, it was very, very weird. Mm. Um and I like going teaching, and I was teaching a girl. I've taught for years, and she was like eight or something, and she's now 25. And I was at her yard teaching her. And we'd finished teaching, and I mean, they're like family to me. And we finished, and I was just talking to her, and the guy that owned the yard had a lesson come after us, and they, then they came in the school, and the mother came up to me. She went, like, sorry, we recognised your voice from YouTube. Would you <laughs> mind having it? I'm like, really? And like, yeah, I'm just a bit like, to me, I'm just, I'm just me. Yeah. It's like even even ride wines, I've always said, I don't think I'm better than anybody else. I just do me mm-hmm. and my own thing. Um, but yeah, it's very odd. Very odd. How have you found growing your socials now? Because now you're like actively posting on your socials and stuff. You say I'm actively. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I have some guys that do um, a lot of it for me. Yeah. I'm, I'm too busy teaching and things mm-hmm. like that. And, and to be fair, when I first found out who Meg was, I was like, great, I want a piece of this. And then I started posting a bit and I was a bit like, this is too much like hard work. <laughs> um, so, no, I mean, it is great. I have to say, I find Instagram easier than, than Facebook. So yeah. I sort of link the two that it automatically goes on the stories and things mm-hmm. on my Facebook thing. Um, and I do have to really make myself, and I do get nagged at a lot by by these guys to um, <laughs> sort of like just post. Whenever I'm going around, just take a picture and post it. Yeah. And I, I do try and do that. But, yeah, it is a bit, yeah, trying to keep up with it all. I just, yeah, I find it hard work. Very, very busy person. (laughs) What does a typical day look like in your life? So it varies, really. I mean, obviously, I've got the two horses at home, which I have to do. Um, I've got some great guys at the yard that if I'm away doing it. And, I mean, it varies. So normal days, well, normal home days, I sort of get up, muck out, I'll ride, Mm -hmm. probably go off and do a few lessons sort of locally and things, then get back and put to bed. Um, And that's about it, really. I don't really do anything else. (laughs) Um, but then I have um, a couple of people that I also do some show grooming for, mm-hmm. which I love doing. It gets I get to go to the big shows and things, and I love keeping my hand in that, and, and I really like that. It's like I get as much sort of pleasure and satisfaction sending something down the centre line that looks beautiful, is well turned out, um, as I do doing it myself, going yeah. down the centre line, um, and... And then, yeah, so if I'm there, if I'm doing that, then I'll normally go down the night before to where they are because they're sort of down south way. And then we'll go to the shows and I'll stay away at the shows with those. Um, and then busy teaching days, it will be normally get up, crack of dawn. I'll muck my guys out and then leave the girls to sort of sort them out. And, I, and they can ride them as well. Um, and then I'll literally disappear off teaching. Mm-hmm. And whether it be going to one place to teach or I do a lot sort of like round Shropshire and I've done that for years. Um, and I'll literally drive from one place to the next to the next. Yeah. Just teaching and, and, and doing For that. anyone who is curious about your teaching, what areas do you cover? All sorts. All sorts, everywhere. <laughs> you name it, yeah. I mean, I started going up to like Yorkshire Way. Yeah. Um, we've got inquiries in Kent to go and do, in Cornwall mm-hmm. to go and do everywhere yeah if there's enough people i will go um or they can come to me one or the other (laughs) so guys if you didn't know this podcast is powered by atlantic harmony equestrian rich is modeling our navy quarter zip today Um, yeah looking fabulous (laughs) if you do want to check out atlantic harmony equestrian you can head across to our website which is www.atlanticharmonyequestrian.co.uk Right, dilemmas. <laughs> Are we ready? Oh God! Right, go on. Hit okay, me with so it. we popped a question box up on Instagram oh, asking people to give us some dilemmas. <laughs> so the first one we have is: How do you go about choosing the right horse? Um, it's a minefield. It really is a minefield. Mm-hmm. Um, I found that. Like buying a dressage, or say personally for myself, buying a dressage, it's not the big flash movers. I would sooner, like, like the big horse that, that mm-hmm. I've got, it's temperament. You can do anything with a good temperament. Yeah. And it's more about feeling. Not You can't always see what's in there. Mm-hmm. Quite often you have to get on and feel it. 
and and it's sort of trying something. I mean, I've turned up at yards and I've looked over the stable door and gone, no, nah, it's no. not for me. And people get offended at that. Yeah. Like, I don't want to waste your time dragging it out, sitting on it. It's not for me, I can tell. Do you just say that <coughs> flat yeah. out? Yeah, yeah I'm like, no. And I, I've, I've been and looked at horses where people have got on them and trotted it once around and gone, no, it's not not for me, mm-hmm. it's not my sort. Um, and yeah, but it, I mean, if you like like something and you like how it moves and things like that, get on and have a feel of it. Yeah. Cause, and, and that also goes <clears throat> with like my teaching. There's times where I've been teaching people and I'm like, well, just let me have a sit on and it feels completely different to what it looks. Yeah. Um, and I and I said the same goes for like buying buying something. You sit on it, have a feel of it. Mm-hmm. F- see if you feel you can do something with it. If you feel you can do something with it, then you can probably do a lot with it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's it's a minefield buying horses, but yeah, and don't overhaul. Don't go for the biggest, flashiest thing that you can afford or not afford. Mm-hmm. It's like they're not always the best ones. How do you know what's your level of horse? Um, <clears throat> be realistic. Mm. It's like we, well, everybody wants to get to Grand Prix. It's like, but be realistic in what you can train to Grand Prix. Yeah. You're better off having something that you feel you can train to Grand Prix that isn't the biggest mover in the world. Mm-hmm. It is like the, the, the chestnut horse of mine. He's an ex-eventer. He's not a massive mover, but I can do something with him. And as long as you feel you can do something with it and you can change it, then it you you ultimately can. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I've had horses that are the most amazing movers in the world, but the brain's not there. Mm-hmm. In which case, then you ain't going to do it. Yeah. I'd, I'd sooner have something that's not as big a mover, but it's got a good temperament and a good brain, because I can do something with that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and also, over the years, I've, I've uh, personally, I've found the type I can train. <clears throat> the the sharp, crazy ones, they're not for me. I don't have the the balls to do that. Whereas something a little bit slower and a little bit sort of I not not deader but not quite as sharp, I, I, they're they're my type to train. I I can train them all day long. Yeah. Okay. Right. The next question we have <coughs> is how do I find the right instructor? Should I have one or should I have multiple? I I say to all my people, go to other people. Mm-hmm. It's like I'm not God. I don't have the answers to everything, uh, and. Quite often, something that I've been work with, with uh, been working with with a client for like six months to try and sort out, they can go to somebody else and they see it slightly differently and have a yeah. slightly different take on it and fix it in one session, which is fantastic. And and I then say to them like, well, what did they do? How did they fix it? What what was their take on it? It's like we can even as a, even as a trainer, yes, I've got my own way, but I'm can still I'm still open to learning yeah. what someone else's take on it can be. Um, and yeah, I've been to a lot of people over the years and, I, and I've stuck with a lot of people as in like trained with them for, for years. Mm-hmm. Um, and like I said earlier, you, you take a bit from each one yeah. and you make your own system. And, and that's what it's about. It's finding what works for you. And, mm-hmm. and yeah, I, I don't really don't sort of get when trainers get a bit sort of hissy about clients going off to other people. It's like we've all done it. Yeah. Everybody's done it. Them themselves will have done it. Mm-hmm. And so... Yeah, don't be afraid to go to other people and get another take on it. And it's not saying that who you've been training with is wrong. It's just that might might not work for you and your horse. Some somebody else might work for you and your horse. But but yeah, don't don't be open to having other people sort of help you and and give give you ideas. Mm-hmm. This kind of links quite nicely back to that one. Um, so dealing with conflicting <laughs> feedback from trainers about performance and training te- techniques. So you go to one, they tell you something, go to the other, they tell you something. Yeah, and it, it's being able to assess what works for you, what works for your horse. <clears throat> and, I, and it's just being open to ideas. It's like, if I go and help somebody, they might not, everything that I say might not work, but mm-hmm. they might take a little bit from it. Yeah. Um, and yeah, like I said, it's just being open to it and, and not thinking, oh, well, what they say is gospel. Yeah. It's like all, all trainers, all riders have their own way. And, and their own ideas and their own what works for them. As I said earlier, that, that I've got, I've taken bits from everybody and sort of made my own system for it. And, and you, you, as a rider, you yes, you may not want to become a Grand Prix rider, become a trainer, but you still got to find what works for you yeah. and, and, and your horse uh, and, and make your own system in the process. Mm-hmm. 
Okay, next one is tips on getting a horse with a high head carriage to relax into a contact. Um, <clears throat> something like that. I mean, I would always start on the lunge. Mm -hmm. It always starts on the lunge with me. It's like the the sort of like and and the, those sort of basics for me would always be put in under the on course with side reins and things like that. It's like they have the side reins on and the horses have to learn to sort of relax into the side reins. The, the side reins don't give. I, I don't quite get where <clears throat> an eventers are the worst of it. That you sort of, you put the horse on the lunge, you give it some side reins, you, it, the horse has to learn that they have to let go of the side reins to get a nice feeling. And then you stick a rider on and it starts wiggling the bit left and right and he's like, come here. It's like, no, just get on and then give it a pair of side reins with your hands. And just say, there's the side reins, you soften to it. Mm -hmm. And then he's getting them forward enough, working from the hind. You've got to, um, I, I was taught a long time ago, <clears throat> and that's always stuck with me, that you have to build a bridge. So you've got to have push from its hind leg over the back to the bit. Mm -hmm. It's like if you don't have either end of that bridge, then your bridge collapses in the middle. So it's just getting them forward enough and push from the hind legs to the bit to then relax them on the bit down. And and it is hard work. <clears throat> have it, to be fair, having something with a high head carriage isn't as difficult to sort as something that drops the bit back here because then you've got to try and find a contact. Yeah. Um, and just making them loose, using flexions, outside rein, inside flexion, inside leg, making the body loose that they can sort of work through to the bit. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Okay. Tips for staying motivated and focused on long-term goals, especially during setbacks or periods of slow progress. That's hard work. <laughs> and that and that's all about the sort of character that you are. It's sort of, I mean, we've all had times where things go lame and stuff like that, that you think, oh, God, what's the point? Yeah. Horses get taken away, you sort of own and sell horses, things like that. Um, but it's just having to pick yourself up and as I said earlier on through personal sort of things that have happened to me it's like things don't stay crap forever it's something always comes along yeah um so it's just sort of thinking that and just keep pushing through it through tough times keep pushing through because something will always come up and come along that makes everything better again <laughs> how do I improve my horse's suppleness any exercises um leg yielding I mean sort of <sighs> Like for suppleness, leg yield, shoulder ins, trot, in trot, canter, and everything are great. Mm -hmm. But it's making sure you don't ride the leg yield, the shoulder in as an end in themselves. It's like, so I'll do a leg yield with, and I'll move the shoulders more, I'll slow the shoulders down, I'll take the hind mm -hmm. leg. It's making variations within what you're doing. Your horse, yeah. your horse, yes, it will get supple riding a good leg yield, but make variations in things like that to make it even more supple. It's like with, with flexion and bending. <clears throat> It's like take enough, take more bend than you're ever going to need. Because then at least when you want to take a little bit of bend for like the half pass at the show or something, it's a bit, it's easy then. Yeah. It, it's making variations and making bigger variations than you're ever going to need to then make everything else easier. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Right. How long should I warm up before a competition? What does your typical warm up look like? And again, that that's a personal thing. Yeah. It's very, it varies horse to horse. <laughs> So my big horse <clears throat> going around a Grand Prix, I'll, I, I normally have in my head about 30 minutes for anything. So my big horse, he I normally do about 40 for him to sort of get him going, but he'll have breaks in the middle of that so he doesn't get tired. Um, but then <laughs> the Chestnut horse being the odd little character he is, 20 minutes. Mm. If after 20 minutes it isn't getting, it, it's never going to get any better. After 20 minutes, if I do any longer with that, I just end up pissing him off, <laughs> to put it bluntly. Um, yeah, so so with him, I do 20 minutes, and it just varies. Give yourself enough. To, I'd sooner have too long and have to have a walk break yeah, than not have enough time and have to rush to think I, I could have done more to get it there. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, as like I said, the, my chest horse does about 20 minutes, and like I said, if after 20 minutes, it isn't going to get any better, so mm -hmm. just go with it. Um, but then the, the black horse, he does a little bit longer, obviously doing the Grand Prix. But it's also, it's tough. It's tough when you at Grand Prix, like with the big horse, because you can't do everything in yeah. your warm up before you go in, uh, and so you have to pick. So with him, his changes are normally quite reliable. Um, I'll do a little bit of pirouette work with him, um, just on a sort of circle working pirouettes. Um, I go through the canter zigzag because that is a, just a nemesis for both of us. 
Um, a, because he's so big, I run out of room. So I do a little bit with that. <clears throat> then I do a bit the piastre, the passage with him, just to make him hot enough mm -hmm. in the transition and things. And then I'll go in. And, and yeah, it's sort of picking what you need to very quickly sort of sort out in your warm-up yeah. and be prepared. <clears throat> At the end of the day, your warm-up, it's called a warm-up because it's a warm-up. It's not a schooling, let's try and do a half pass when we've never done a half pass before in our lives, before yeah. we go in. It's not training. It's warming up, picking the bits you need to sort of put on your aids at that point before you go in, and that's it. Mm -hmm. Don't try and get something you've never got before. Yeah. Because then it's going to be a disaster. I'm curious. I have a question. <coughs> so I work very low-level dressage, and I hate warm-up arenas. They're the most horrible right. things <laughs> in the world, right? What <coughs> is warm-up arenas like higher up? The because everyone's just crashing into everyone and it's just horrible. And I can imagine your warm arenas. I don't know if you've just made this in my head even more chaotic because yeah. people are doing more yeah. things. Yeah. What's it like? You have to be very sort of switched on. And yeah. you have to be, uh, to be, <laughs> to be fair, at the higher level warm-ups, you, you can sort of be looking at people and get an idea of where they go. Yeah. Low-level warm-ups, especially unaffiliated, are the worst because you have no idea where anybody's going and you get no warning. Yeah. Whereas at, le at least at the higher levels, you can sort of tell, oh, someone's coming to do a pirouette in the middle there or someone's coming mm -hmm. to do a line of changes. But it is very, you have to be quite switched on to sort of pick a line and stick to it. And, and whatever level, you've got to be brave. <laughs> be brave enough to be like, this is my line. And, and to, I have to say, <clears throat> it's slightly easier for me on the big horse because it's massive mm -hmm. and it's big and it's black and it's powerful and people tend to get out your way. If you ride at them on that, people are a bit like, shit, I'll get out of the way of that. Um, but yeah, it's it's being, picking your line, be sensible, but be like, right, no, I need to do that here and you all need to be aware of that. But then it's also being considered and be aware of, like if you're, I want to do a line of change across there and you can see someone is in the middle of doing a canter pirouette in the middle, don't ride at them and be like, well, you need to stop doing that because I need to do a line of changes. Um, but yeah, war warm-ups are just, yeah, I find lower level warm ups of like <laughs> when I'm warming people up at like lower levels, I think, well, no wonder you're about to crash. I had no clue that was turning, yeah, yeah, yeah. turning across there. Um, but yeah, it's just being sensible, have your plan, pick your lines, but yeah, be very aware of people around you riding into you. Yeah. <laughs> so this podcast is called Beyond the Stable. All so right. I want to know what you do beyond the stable. Very Is there anything little. you do for fun? Any? No. What about a summer holiday? So we go on a summer holiday. No. I haven't been. On, I haven't been on holiday for years. But there's nothing you can every, tell me. Every, anything every you do. year, I think, oh, I need to go on holiday this year, and then before I know it, Christmas and everything starts again. What's your dream destination? And let's do that. I have to say, I have always, always wanted to go on a cattle drive. Okay. Always. Ever since I was a kid, the idea of just going somewhere and just driving cattle, sat on a horse, camping out, mm -hmm. has just been a dream of mine. So it's still horse related. It is. I'm afraid, I'm afraid I do nothing apart from the horses. Um, I mean, yeah, I go out for dinner with friends and mm -hmm. things and stuff like that, but, but that's about it. Do you so. have a favourite restaurant? No. Nothing? I eat anything. <laughs> Literally, I will eat anything. Not a favourite, like even cuisine? Not really, no. I do like Chinese. But, Chinese? Yeah, but anything really. Especially if it's done for me. Yeah. If it's done for me and put <laughs> in front of me, I will eat it. <laughs> Amazing. So, as you know, we are travelling up and down the country, speaking yeah. to professionals, influencers. Is there anyone that you would love to see on the podcast? Not really, no. I don't really... <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't really know. It's like... I don't really know anybody that I would sort of say, oh, I'd really want to see them because mm. it's a bit like... Is there anyone that you looked up to maybe when you were younger or that you've worked with now that you really like working with and you think they'd be interesting to speak to? I mean, obviously, we, I've looked up to like Carl and everybody and everything, but I've heard him on things so many times I could probably <laughs> tell you the script. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, I don't really know. I mean, probably... I mean, I've all, there's always people like Isabel Vers and people like that that I'd love to go and spend some time with or just talk to and things mm -hmm. like that 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 are like have have been to so many championships and won so many medals and things like that and they keep managing to produce horses to that level. Yeah. All various shapes, sizes, colours, 
abilities and they always get them there. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, I mean, people like that are always interesting to me. I'll watch those on like YouTube and things and yeah. be like, oh, what can I take from that? And, and even doing that, there's bits that you can take and, and think, oh, I hadn't even thought of that. Mm -hmm. Um, it was like somebody, so I trained with Serena Pincus for, for a while and I find David, her husband, very interesting. Um, I remember one thing he said to me was I had a horse that um, didn't canter very well. He said, oh, you need to teach that to Pierre. And I was like, really? Well, mm -hmm. why is that going to help its canter? He said, because Piaf has the same mechanics that you want in the canter. You want them to sit on the high leg, to round the back, to drop the neck, to lift the shoulders. He said, teach it to Piaf and it will help the canter. And it did, to be fair. And, and again, that goes back in with the finding of trainers and things. It's like everyone has something you can learn. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so no, I, I, I don't really know anybody to, <laughs> to say bring on the podcast, but yeah. Someone if you could that. get Isabel Verth, I would come and watch it. <laughs> <laughs> That's the goal. Then. <laughs> well, thank you so much for being on That's the podcast. Right, no, thank you. You absolutely smashed it. Amazing. Yeah, it's been more enjoyable than I thought it would be. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, if you have watched this episode on YouTube, then make sure you're subscribing, giving us a comment, giving us a like. If you're over on Spotify, make sure you're leaving us a review, preferably five stars. That'd be amazing. <laughs> um, but yeah, thank you so much for being yeah, on no, it. Brilliant. Thank it's you guys for watching. Yeah, and we'll and I'll see you, see you next time. See you at the demo, guys. Yes. Get your tickets for the demo. Bro. <laughs>